The story of Leopold's acquisition and eventual conquest of the Congo is a story about one man's greed and his willingness to exploit people and territory in order to acquire riches. Throughout Leopold's life, he was obsessed with transforming Belgium into an empire similar to England, France, or Spain. Adam Hotschild, the author of King Leopold's Ghost, argues that Leopold felt confined by the negligible size of his homeland and wanted it to reflect his grand desires of expansion and conquest. As Leopold's future actions show, he stopped at nothing to meet this dream. April 9, 1835. Belgium, a country still in infancy, tucked neatly between France, Germany, and the Netherlands, is where King Leopold the Elder's second wife Louise gives birth to their second child. A child who would someday grow up to create and maintain, all without ever setting foot there, one of the most gruesome examples of European exploitation in Africa. Leopold II, the fox who crossed the stream. As a boy, Leopold was given all the best in education and military training that a young heir to a European throne could ever need. But Leopold was different. The small, awkward boy who held the rank of Major General by the time he was 20, with the exception of geography, had no desire for the education his royal bloodline entitled him to. Leopold spoke French and German in his father's court, as well as becoming fluent in English. But despite the fact that more than half the citizens he would rule over spoke it, he never bothered to learn Flemish. In Belgium, the language division also defined social class, with the wealthy businessmen and professionals speaking French, while the factory workers and farmers living in poverty spoke Flemish. Leopold's relationship with his father was cold, with little affection and minimal face-to-face -face communication. It was through this environment that Leopold learned a skill that would prove invaluable throughout his life, networking. Leopold found that many people hoped to win the favor of the future king, and he took advantage of it. Government officials befriended Leopold and helped satisfy the young heir's passion for geography and desires to learn about far-off lands. Leopold was married at the age of 18, and like most royal marriages in Europe at the time, Leopold's was arranged and politically motivated. His father was looking to cement relations with Austria-Hungary and decided on Archduchess Marie Henriette, a Habsburg. The two despised each other. The arrangement was a disaster. Leopold would go days without speaking to his wife, and Marie once wrote to a friend, if God hears my prayers, I shall not go on living much longer. As a young man, prior to his ascent to the Belgian throne, Leopold traveled the globe learning everything he could about colonization and how the empires of Europe were so successful at conquering lands across six continents. When Leopold rose to the throne in 1865, he did so with only one goal in mind, building and ruling his very own colony. By the age of 26, Leopold was ready to start his slow, meticulous acquisition of the Congo. In March 1862, Leopold arrived in Seville, Spain. His ultimate goal was not to be a tourist, but a student. He wanted to learn about this colonization hub and the steps that Spain took in the construction of its vast empire. He knew that what he was about to undertake would be similar to the actions of the conquistadors during the exploration of the Americas. So, there was no better place to start. However, his process was much more political. Leopold realized the necessity for him to implant the idea of his philanthropic motivations towards colonization in the heads of European leaders. Using this knowledge, Leopold set up the entire charade of the International African Association through a September 1876 meeting with the leading explorers of his time. This meeting, and to a further extent, his appointment as the chair of the International African Association convinced Europe that he was a saint among greedy, power-hungry European empires. The creation of this myth was key in his eventual takeover of the Congo. Unfortunately, it took 23 years for Europe to see through Leopold's web of lies. Instead, Leopold continued his gradual process of acquiring the Congo. Henry Morton Stanley was possibly the most influential individual to travel throughout Africa. However, his life did not start as much. 
He was a son born out of wedlock in Britain in 1841. However, he soon moved to the United States. As Stanley grew, his enormous dreams continued to exceed anything expected of him. Yet, he was able to become one of the most influential men within the Congo by acquiring the Congo Basin and following this monstrous, the monstrous Congo River. Still, these accomplishments were not able to hide the insecurities that defined Stanley's life and ultimately allowed for Leopold so successfully to capitalize on Stanley's deficiencies. By the age of 43, Leopold had his first meeting with Henry Morton Stanley. Stanley was the perfect pawn for Leopold to use throughout his reign in the Congo. Stanley was commended by every European nation for his actions in exploring the Black Continent. Leopold knew that Stanley had much to gain from his request to help in the colonization of the Congo. Stanley jumped on Leopold's request because of his longing to be utilized by a monarch. In the subsequent five years, Stanley started to make the Congo more accessible through carving out paths and exploring previously uncharted lands. However, the French soon started to claim land for France through treaties with local tribe leaders that essentially rendered all of their land to the French. A race for the land around the Congo ensued. Leopold realized he needed to act quickly. He soon forged over 450 treaties with the Congolese chiefs that gave him total control of the Congo area. Although close to consolidating his empire in Africa, Leopold was still not done. He needed a large, powerful nation to recognize Belgium as a legitimate owner of this land. Sanford was Leopold's final key to having the colony he so greatly desired. General Sanford was the American ambassador to Belgium at the time of Leopold's reign. Stanley and Sanford were much alike. Both Stanley and Sanford were puppets for Leopold to use however he wished. Also, each were easily, easily manipulated due to their desires to impress and be utilized by a monarch. Thus, Sanford was perfect for his role. Sanford traveled to the United States in order to persuade senators and representatives to recognize the Congo as Belgian territory in order to allow for the most righteous men to cleanse the Congolese people. But it was the racism which convinced the senators and representatives to recognize the Congo. These senators saw the opportunity to allow for a mass exodus of African Americans in the wake of the Civil War. They saw the ability to divert the anger that these people had towards the slave system as a way to get rid of them, but help themselves at the same time. It was this that ultimately allowed for the United States to be the first country to recognize the Congo as Leopold's. Like in the United States, Leopold used subsidiaries to gain recognition. Each of these had direct contact to elected officials, but more importantly, the leaders. Through these select individuals, Leopold was able to gain recognition from not only the United States, but also France and Germany. Still, he was not done. It wasn't until on November 15, 1884, the Berlin Conference, a meeting of all major European powers that had sovereignty in the Congo was officially recognized. At the age of 54, all of his political deception finally came to fruition. Leopold was ready to enter the Congo for his one true reason, money and nothing was going to stop him. The indigenous who resided within the Congo territory were thought of as savages. Leopold told the public that they were uncivilized, untamed, and uncultured people who were in desperate need of European intervention and civilization. This was his initial plight to public support of exploration and colonization of the Congo. May 29, 1885 the day that the king named his new and privately controlled country the Congo Free State. There was a national anthem, Towards the Future, that solidified Leopold's possession of his dream colony. Weaponry, medical knowledge, and steamboats were the tools used by a few thousand white men to dominate 20 million Africans. As Leopold's men discovered the Congo and became more familiar, familiar with the land, Leopold came upon the discovery of ivory. The ivory in the Congo was worth more because the elephants in the Congo and equatorial Africa had much larger tusks than those in India. The ivory could be made into piano keys and false teeth. The low bulk and the high value made the ivory well worth long distances the ivory had to be carried from the elephant ranges. The ivory was an economic benefit for King Leopold because the ivory dealers valued it as if it was a precious metal or a drug. Rubber was the next discovery for Leopold in his reign. Due to the Industrial Revolution, the global demand for rubber rapidly grew. This was not only because of hoses. Tubing, gaskets, and rubber insulation for the telegraph, telephone, and electrical wiring 
also demanded rubber. The increasing demand led to an increase in prices in the 1890s and a huge economic opportunity for King Leopold's Congo, where the rubber vines covered half the land, with vines climbing high up into the trees. The rubber boon was a godsend for Leopold because he didn't need to acquire fertilizer, cultivation, or capital investment. He only needed manual labor. That is when he adopted the method of forced labor with the indigenous Congolese. The native Congolese did not voluntarily agree to harvest the rubber for days at a time in the flooded forest. They had to be compelled to do this. The indigenous would be compelled by the force publique, Leopold's private army that used military force to exert their superiority. In the 1890s, the force publique grew to consist of more than 19,000 officers. These officers were the people who attacked the natives, took the women and children as hostages, and held the women and children until the chief of the district turned in the required amount of kilograms of rubber. The hostage taking set the forced labor system in the Congo apart from other systems. However, the system that existed in the Congo was not entirely because the Congo operated on quotas. Men in villages would often tear down the entire rubber vine in order to squeeze as much sap out of the vine as possible. Although the Congo state had strict orders against killing the vines and cutting them down entirely, they were also extremely harsh punishments if the natives did not meet the quotas. These punishments involved a chiquette, a whip made of a dried hippopotamus hide, which left permanent scarring and serious health implications. Simply 25 lashes could render a victim unconscious, and 100 or more lashes could be fatal for the victim. Resistance was not tolerated by the force publique. Native people would try to avoid meeting quotas and other requirements placed upon the natives by the force publique by running away into the woods. The force publique would sit in the garden, patiently waiting the escapees to return to the villages because of starvation and exhaustion from lack of food and clean water. When the natives would return, the force publique would shoot them. The force publique was a deadly force in the Congo. When Leopold's rule in the Congo was in full effect, the natives resisted. The Yaka people fought the white men for nearly 10 years until 1900. The Shokui also fought for 20 years and killed hundreds of Leopold's soldiers. Also, in the Kasi region, the Kuba people, who were typically very peaceful, had an uprising in order to turn the force publique's bullets into water. The Kuban rebels burned Leopold's trading posts and mission stations, only to be met by bullets that killed 180 of the native Kuban people. The bullets were not turned to water, and the force publique once again prevailed with their modern technology and warfare devices. Due to the false depictions and statements about what was going on in the Congo, there was little exposure to the atrocities that Leopold was committing in the Congo. George Washington Williams entered the Congo and took a leap of empathy. He saw Leopold's reign as a theft of indigenous land and freedom rather than as a progressive civilization. He originally traveled to the Congo to write a short book called Open Letter that exposed the atrocities he saw while in the Congo. Such problems include deceiving and tricking the indigenous to think the white officials had supernatural powers in order to get the Africans to surrender land, the officials that oversaw the Congo were tyrants, the established military bases caused a wave of death and destruction, prisoners, prisoner cruelty, Leopold's claims of the government were false, and the military officials were capturing women as concubines. Williams was the first to expose the atrocities that occurred in the Congo, However, he was also not the last. Leopold openly practiced a forced labor system that terrorized the Congolese people into submission. The atrocities committed by Leopold and the forced publique seemed unfathomable to the current day world, yet it was commonplace within Africa for this, for this system of terror to reign supreme. Fortunately, the Congo did not go unnoticed. Roger Caseman and Edie Morell headed the effort to end the Leopold's reign of terror over the Congolese people. Edie Morell, the, the leader of the entire movement, constantly wrote newspaper articles, books, and pamphlets, which described the actions in the Congo for what they were, atrocious. Unlike Morell, Caseman was able to depict the horrendous actions of Leopold and the Force Publique actively practiced through his own experiences within the Congo. This gave a compelling contrast for Mel, who, like Leopold, never set foot within the Congo. Slowly, Morell started to win over supporters. In order to obtain a more organized movement, he created the Congo Reform Association, CRA. This association was pivotal in the attempt to remove Leopold from the Congo. 
Morrill used this organization to provide the most influential aspect of his reform organization, the pictures he spread throughout Europe and America that depicted the horrors that occurred within the Congo. These pictures gave irrefutable evidence that no piece of propaganda presented by Leopold could refute. Morrill's campaign was able to gain popularity in large part due to the country he was targeting, Belgium. Belgium was a small enough country to where Britain, France, Spain, or Germany knew there, be, knew there would not be a strong enough resistance from Leopold or the Belgian Congress to oppose the relocation of rule within the Congo. If this campaign were to target any of the major European empires, reform would be impossible because of trade implications and the overall, uh, overall unwillingness from such a large company to give up a piece of their prized empire. Thus, Belgium was the perfect country to direct African reform towards. This process was painstakingly slow. However, as Hashai points out, attacks on Leopold were not coming from all quarters. During the decade, branches or affiliates would spring up in Germany, France, Norway, Switzerland, and other countries. In response to accusations aimed at Leopold and his occupancy within the Congo, the Belgian king began to attack. Most importantly, Leopold transferred money to leading publishers within each country in order to, in order to print favorable articles about him. However, Morrill's campaign soon traveled across the ocean to the United States, who, as Morrill described, had a special responsibility to bring Leopold's bloody, bloody rule to an end. This was the first country to have recognized the Congo. Like Leopold, Morrill craft, masterly crafted his agenda to fit American appeals. Morrill lobbied for reform to everyone from Mark Twain to the racist Southern Senator John Tyler Morgan. However, Leopold reacted swiftly and even more effectively. He soon aligned his interests with the major money brokers such as J.P. Morgan and John D. Rockefeller by promising a piece of the profit from the Congo. Ultimately, it was the connection with these businessmen and the powerful senator, Nelson Aldrich, which allowed for any creation of an American Congo Reform Committee to be stopped. However, Leopold finally took a misstep. The Belgian king hired the influential Henry I. Kowalski to travel, Wall to, travel to Wall Street and campaign in favor of the Leopold's Congo. However, having such a figure, who is well known to align with unlawful people for a certain price, gave Leopold an unintended perception that neither he nor his Belgian consulate desired. Instead, a year later, he cut his contract with Kowalski, which marked the true downfall of his reign within the Congo. Immediately after his contract was terminated, Kowalski exposed Leopold's manipulation in the Congo, annexing any positive relationship Leopold had with the United States, but not convincing most of Europe. Instead, in 1904, Leopold created a commission of inquiry in the intent to prove his innocence within the Congo. However, Leopold once again messed up in his vain attempts to downplay and ignore his hideous actions within the Congo. He did this by appointing three judges, a Belgian, Swiss, and Italian. However, none previously worked within the Congo or spoke any English or any of the native African languages. Each judge heard stories from countless chiefs, workers, and children who detailed the countless floggings, raids, and shootings they received and witnessed. Much to Leopold's disdain, the commission was not going to reflect the, reflect the Congo for what Leopold claimed it to be. Instead, Leopold realized that it was going to be properly portrayed in the gross, hideous light that Mor Morel and Ca Casement long campaigned for. These missteps are what ultimately allowed for Leopold's web of lies to untangle and come crashing down. However, the Congo was not relinquished from Leopold's power yet. Instead, Leopold realized that desperation engulfed the Belgian government in their attempts to retake the privately owned Congo. They witnessed the embargo Britain put on Portugal for using slave labor and did not wish this ill fate upon their own country. Instead, Belgium pushed Leopold to relinquish the Congo to Nguyen Bale. Instead, Leopold capitalized on his newfound position of power by selling the Congo to the desperate Belgian government. This only bought Leopold more time and control of the Congo through a secretive nature of the true profitability of the Congo. However, on November 15, 1908, two years after the Commission of Inquiry was released, Leopold's reign over the Congo came toppling down as the, gov as the Belgian government finally bought the land Leopold so desperately coveted. Although Leopold relinquished his control over the Congo, the people still were not free from Belgian rule. Instead, they still had to endure rule under European control. However, bloodshed still continued. Within the 1950s, the Congo was ignited by African demands for self-control. However, 
still existing, the Fourth Publik attempted to quell these uprisings. Yet, by 1960, the Congo gained the freedom the people desperately deserved by rallying behind their new radical leader, Patrice Lumaba. Unfortunately, Belgium was not willing to meet the demands of Lumaba by relinquishing the Congo as a colony. Yet, the Congo was still immensely profitable for Belgium and the permitted American corporations within the Congo. As a result, Belgian government, with collaboration from the CIA, captured Lumaba and transferred him to be shot and killed by a firing squad. To further ingrain American and Belgian interest within the Congo, Joseph Desire Mobutu was appointed as the leader of the Congo. However helpful he was to the American and Belgian nations, he was just as brutal towards his own people. It took 37 years to finally overthrow this barbaric regime. The Congo still feels the effects of the vicious European possession and direct influence which spanned 112 brutal years. Within Belgium, people continuously ignore the systematically vicious regime that dominated Leopold's rule and the history of the Congo. As important as this may be to the history of the Congo, the Royal Museum of Central Africa completely ignores the atrocities that occurred over the 30-year period. Instead of acknowledging these atrocities, Belgium chooses to ignore these vicious acts in order to keep their moral slates clean. They choose to look at African history with a large, gaping hole during their horrendous European colonization. The Royal Museum of Central Africa unfortunately purposefully ignores the barbaric history of European nations within Africa, which just further ingrains false historical knowledge into visitors of the museum. King Leopold II was born into royalty. He was surrounded by resources which he utilized and exploited in his colonization of the Congo. His greed, fostered when he was a young boy, drove him to exploit the Congolese for their labor in harvesting elephant tusks and rubber in order to grow the Belgian economy and get a foot in the door of imperialism. King Leopold II was a greedy man, and his eventual downfall did not come soon enough for the Congolese people. The representation of the atrocities that occurred in the Congo have not been, and still are not, adequately portrayed to the public in the Royal Museum for Central Africa. Despite this, King Leopold's ghost will live on, hopefully through a more accurate and unbiased filter.